some ships are famous the world over because of their deeds. And some ships should be famous the world over because of their deeds. And some ships should just be famous because of their history. And the Belanco Eschlada is probably one of the latter. She just should be famous. She's not, but she should be. I have got to have World of X split because they've changed things again. So, the War of the Pacific, the Chilean Civil War, and the sinking of the Blanco Enclada, Enchilada. The ironclad naval lessons from South America. It's one of those rich parts of naval history which gets forgotten oh so often. The fact that there is quite so much naval history which does not come from the four or five nations which seem to get the vast majority of the writing in the English language world. And I always use the phrase English language world, but one of the sad things, and I know this far too well, is that in my experience the amount of writing done outside the English language world on naval affairs is not always the greatest. There is... What writing there is is often very good and very interesting, but is not often the greatest volume. And I don't think that's due to a lack of interest. In my experience, it's not. In my experience, Naval historians of some of the Spanish-speaking countries who I have worked with will often tell you it is easier to get copies of books produced by English language historians to research from than is to get books of written by their fellow their fellow country citizens, their fellow you know the the people who are a door or two down in the office block. I have no idea why, and honestly I haven't done an exhaustive amount of research to try and find out, because I don't have the time. But I think it is possibly visible in terms of the amount which gets, therefore gets translated. Because if books are difficult enough to find in their own language when they're produced. The odds of them getting translated into another language is much, much lower. Although I will say this, I have a trick that you should probably learn. When I am trying to hunt down ships that do not come from English-speaking nations and I want to find their sources and I want to find good source about them. My first trick is usually to try and track down the Wikipedia which is in the language that that ship served in. So, for example, the Blanco Enclada. Now, the English language Wikipedia entry has some very interesting links. Very interesting links. But the Wikipedia article, which is produced in Spanish, has probably three of the most interesting links I've seen. Uh, Pascal Moreno's, uh, Moreno's uh, well, Mor Pascal something Moreno. Um, it, 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 it's spelt smoked, okay? It's spelt smoked, but it, I don't think Pasquale Smoked Moreno is it. I think, honestly, the lovely people at Translate have translated that from something else. Um, wrote in 1888, Guerre de Pacifico. Complete uh, compilation of the official documents, correspondence, and obligations referring to the war that, pre uh, that the press of uh, presidents of Chile, Peru, and Bolivia have brought to light containing unpublished documents of importance. Now that sounds like a really interesting work, and it's published in 1888. And I'm going to have to try and track me down an English language copy, because I'm fairly certain that 
my Spanish skills do not l go to that higher level of Spanish as it's probably written on that. I think that's probably a little bit over my Spanish skills. But there's also, from 19, uh, 1911, uh, Gonzalo Bulnes, uh, The Pacific War. That's another interesting one. And as James Wilson King, The Warships and Navies of the World, 1880. Published in 1880. So, there you go. A little bit of a trick. A little bit of a thing for you to think about. As always, shameless book plug, tribals, battles, and daring's. But that's not the only plug I'm going to do at this point. I'm going to quickly bring up the Shipshape Expedition 2023. Now, this is a big, important weekend when this is coming to you. I'm not sure what we are in terms of funds raised, but I do know where we need to be. I do know where we need to get to. We are hoping by the end of this weekend, so this is coming out on the 29th of April. At the end of this weekend, we hope to have enough that we can basically say right and we're halfway to getting all the funds we require for this trip we can therefore shunt funds and the two of us who are need the funds up in front can pay for all the all the things they need to pay for and then hopefully we keep fundraising and therefore we can pay for the two, uh, we can reimburse the two who can afford to pay up front or rather, who can afford to put it on uh, on credit cards? Because that is what we're all doing. We're doing the naval historian's trick. How I financed this book and the research in this book because the advance was not enough by any stretch of the imagination. I wish it had been, but it was not. It was a lovely, lovely advance, but it was not enough. And so I financed this on a credit card. That's how I managed to end up with nearly six grand's worth of credit card debt. And it's the reality of naval history. A lot of the younger historians, a lot of the younger academics, a lot of younger people like Drac and like Dan and even Gareth. Garris the Brit. How we have to finance these projects to get them off you can't go and ask for a loan and it's the websites are set up to get investment and support are expensive and charge a lot of money this is why we set up our own website and you can't use patron funding etc to secure a loan or all, any of those things it, which makes sense and frankly patron and the YouTube income from subscribers and people who've join the channel that's essential for keeping day-to-day -day historical work going let alone the big expeditions so yes this would go on this goes on credit cards and I currently would if I hadn't had the issues with work I've recently had would have put it through already at least a few big things on my credit card hoping I get the money back but if I don't Intending to pay it off slowly. Trouble is, my credit card is currently pretty much maxed, thanks to um, the issues I've had with pay recently. Which are mm, heading for resolved, but the trouble is the complications caused are going to take longer. But no. There is a link down below, and if you would like to support our trip to Australia... That would be an amazing thing. There are going to be more trips to come after this. This is, a, this is, in many ways, a continuation of what we did in Canada. And for those who want to see more about what we did get up to in Canada, there is on the page... Hopefully it works. Come on. We have some pictures. 
including all the important things. And some of the museums we went to. And the thing is, what we did in Canada, and the lives we did in, and lives we did in Canada, and the tweets, and the videos, and all the other stuff that has come out from it, the videos on this channel, the videos on Drax channel, all the stuff is in many ways what we want to do even larger in Australia. Now we have our initial flights on it. One of the interesting things was the flights from uh, to from Australia were when we were estimating them were roughly for, for the price we're looking at were nearly four thousand pounds. Currently the flights, if we can book them this weekend uh, you know next weekish time are got about two grand. This is why the price has dropped. We've managed to drop from saying we think we need 40 odd grand to 28, please. It sounds a big drop, but when your price of your flights have dropped by two grand and you times that by four, that's eight grand gone already. And then we found the hotels, thanks to the exchange rate, have been cheaper the whole way through. And the internal flights have been cheaper. The in whole way through. It'll, not by much, but by enough. It's added up to, we can go, look, we only need... It's still a lot of money. We do apologise. But we want to do all this history for you. We want to do all this history. We've literally, for some reason, we've scheduled three days in Sydney. Looking at all those ships at the Australian Maritime Museum, I can't think why we've scheduled three days in Sydney. And all the stuff. It's Brisbane. Uh, we've also got a Queensland Maritime Overflow Day there. And in Perth, we've got rest day. Possible fan meetup recovery allowing. We would like to have a lot of fan meetups. We'd like to have a lot of events if we can put them in. So... We want to come and see you all as well as we can in Australia, as we did in Canada. But we need your support. And we need this to work. So, this is a special weekend, which is why I'm spending just that minute of time on this. But it's gone now. Back to the shameless book plug. Now... Ordering a navy is not an easy task. It's really not an easy task. And basically for Chile, you have their navy, and to thank for their navy, and what they've done and accomplishes in the war of the Pacific, and even in the Chilean Civil War, you have to thank these two gentlemen. You have to fa uh, thank... Now... Please let me get this right. Federico Marcus de Rosio Arazano Zanatoro. Who is this gentleman? Very good beard. I have a great respect. He has a good beard. Okay. He becomes president of Chile. And his first thing, almost, is... Well, I've been the minister of the war of the navy... In fact, I served in that role from September 1866 to November 1868. And I'd also served in that role from January 1865 till March 1865. And he'd also been Minister of Justice and Public Instruction as well. But the thing is, he'd been Minister of War in the Navy of Chile. And he basically came out and went, um, yeah... We haven't been funding these. Almost the complete reverse of any other defence secretary who's ever become president of their country afterwards. He hasn't used experience to justify cutting the armed forces so he can spend the money on other pet projects. No. He went, we need to do this. And in a turn up for the books, when he pushes through the vote, when he pushes it through and he goes, there are tensions with Argentina and Bolivia. He sends a bill to Congress authorizing the executive branch to acquire two new armored ships. There is only one vote which rejects. That is the vote of Jose Joaquim Perez Masquiano, who not only was a member of Congress, but was the previous president of Chile. 
who voted against it because, well... He felt that the meagre fiscal coffers and debts caused by previous wars meant that they should do everything they should to avoid fighting wars in the future. And he thought the best way to avoid fighting a war was to not have any equipment to fight a war with. As we all know, usually when opponents and other nations are looking at their sister nations and are going, we must decide who to fight a war with. They look at the ones who have no equipment and go, we will not fight with you. It will be no honour as the victory will be too easy. It is a well-known fact that nations do not fight and attack those who they feel it will be too easy to win against. Now, at this point, usually I would just leave that hanging there and carry on the lecture, but I do realise this is YouTube, not my lecture theatre, and I do sometimes have to explain when I'm being sarcastic. So please note, the last statements were sarcastic. I, uh, before anyone says, no, we do realise when you're being sarcastic, I have re read my comment section on occasion. I have seen what some have written. I hope most of you get the sarcasm, but for some, my sarcasm is just too deep. Too much beyond the third wall. Too much. Now, he, and by he, I mean the important president here, Federico Marcos de Rosio Erezuiz Zanatu, basically turns around to his right-hand man in the UK, Alberto Bless Ghana. Now, what I love is Google Translate, when it translates this Spanish Wikipedia page to English, translates that as Alberto Blessed Wins. And I think that's appropriate because he is almost the Chilean Charles Dickens. He produces a wonderful collection of books, but also... On top of that, he is an absolutely exceptionally good and organised ambassador. He is the minister in England and he is put to manage the project. He goes to find Edward James Reed, a former naval architect with the British Admiralty, i.e. a former naval constructor. Engages him as a technical advisor. Doesn't engage him to design the ships. Engages him as a technical advisor and overseer. So instead of going, I'm going to single sword us and take this one person's point of view. No, no, no. I'm going to go get an independent architect to advise me and allow me to have an independent expert witness to look at what's being done. And then he goes to Earl Shipbuilding Company in Hull, Yorkshire and gives them the commission to carry out the construction. And they'll build two ships. Now, these two ships are the Lord Cochrane class. And, of course, they're named for Almirante Cochrane. But, originally, they were to be named Almirante Cochrane and Valapri uh, Cochrane and Valaparisa. Originally they were to be named Valaparisa. Which is a nice name to give what is going to be one of your capital ships, but it doesn't work out that. And you see, you have to start thinking this is not just building a navy. This is not just ordering a navy. President Zanato is not just ordering a navy. He wants to build and encapsulate a navy in Chile. And I think the measure of how well he does this is how well the Chilean navy has survived to this day. The Chilean navy is part of Chile. It's a big part of Chile in their 
psychology and their understanding and their history. And I would argue a lot of it is down not just not to the early work and the early fancy things with Cochrane and other things that go on there. No. Not even to the work of, you know, uh, Manuel de Jose Blanco Sicalvo de Anclara, aka the president who and first admiral of the Chilean Navy who the ship is named for. No. It's down to the work of this man who spends the next five years of his presidency. And he is president from the September the 18th, 1871 to September the 18th, 1876. He spends five years trying to instill in every artifice of Chilean life, culture, soul that he can the necessity and value of a navy. Apologies. And it's for a different reason than we can think about because traditionally when we're talking about navies, we're talking about nations which have wide commercial interests around the world or, or an island nations, but Chile has a huge land border. It does. But for Chile, their defensive depth and their defensive operational maneuver is the sea. Their ability to bring firepower in to support them, their ability to maneuver their forces from one point, one contested area to another area, is the sea. When you think about it, in in terms of warfare, Chile turns naval warfare and our traditional understanding on its head. Because usually when we're talking about sea lines of communication, we're talking about your external lines of manoeuvre. Away from your homeland. With Chile, the sea lines of communication are their internal lines of communication. They're the ones they have to secure, because if they secure those, they can manoeuvre their force around and defend themselves. Because they have no room to manoeuvre and depth of manoeuvre at sea, on the land. The Chilean geography doesn't allow for it. The Chilean territory doesn't allow for it. And that... That is something to think about. That is something to consider that for Chile, what is the value of a navy? The value of a navy is the internal lines of communication. Yes, it gives them global reach and diplomatic power, and at points it gives them actual more firepower and commission than the US Navy had. But leaving that to one side, leaving that to one side, they weren't pursuing it for that status. They're pursuing it because a navy, and this was what was recognised by the president, a navy is what was critical to their survival, because as long as they had a navy, as long as they were able to protect what were for them their internal lines of communication, Chile could weather storms. Chile could survive. Now, they go to Earl's Shipbuilding Company. And this is another of the ships that Earl's is famous for. HMS St. George, built in 1892. So, seven years after the Blanco and Cloud. And the thing is... This really shows you what Earl's builds. They are not one of the big flashy builders in Britain. They are not one of the big high-status builders in Britain. They build... Workmen like cruisers, Edgar class cruisers. They build central battery ironclads. They build ships which are known for three things one, reliability, two, quality craftsmanship, and three, coming in at the price they have or they have offered them at. 
Again, it's an interesting selection going on here. But again, you can't help think that the lovely, and I would argue him a, a little bit of a um, fortuitous find in Alberta Blescana, the ambassador manager, that, uh, and the ambassador and sort of the manager of the program, they have found someone who is prepared. In a way, perhaps it's all novelists have to be prepared to understand when, what they don't know and to go find out what they need to know. It's something I've always found interesting when I have worked with or been friends with and ch just chatted with people who are very good novelists, people who are very good writers. This channel, Glyn Stewart, turns up a lot because he is very, very good at science fiction, writes very good books. But the reason he writes such good books is because he knows what he knows, he also knows what he doesn't know, and he's quite prepared to go and ask people for what he needs to know. And he doesn't just ask one source, he asks a couple of sources. And he finds it out before he makes a decision, before he writes it in. And Charles Dickens used to do research, and I am certain that as both a novelist and a diplomat, and considering the other things he did, that Alberto blessed Ghana did a lot of research before he made decisions on how to spend his nation's money. And boy, did he get those decisions right. Because he really, really got them some good quality ships. And they work hard. But there is another annoying thing with oh, shipbuilding. They, they didn't actually probably charge enough value for what they were building. They should have probably charged a little bit more. Because you can tell this because they suffer from almost permanent cash flow problems in the latter part of the 1890s. Because the trouble is there is rampant inflation going on this period because of the technological upgrade going on. So every new generation of technology, oh, it's better than the previous one, so it must be worth more. And it's hard to keep your pricing up. And the the, the companies which padded their pricing more <coughs> were able to still make a profit because they had that bigger gap. And the companies would have tried to run it, let's say, efficient profit levels found that gap gone or minimized, so they had cash flow. This is how they get bought in, well, in 1900, when they enter voluntary liquidation, and they become a subsidiary of the Wilson line. But they still carry on building stuff for South America, including the SS Inca for the Peruvian Corporation. One of the really annoying things that happens is in 1932, the National Shipbuilder Securities take over the ship, uh, uh, ship line. Um, and the National Shipbuilder Securities sold Earl's tools and machinery and shipping uh, and took, sent a lot of ships, uh, the yard's largest crane and other equipment to uh, Kowloon in Hong Kong. This meant the yard was decommissioned in 1932 and unfortunately the terms of the closure included a restrictive covenant on the site which prescribed any shipbuilding there for the following 60 years now by the way a vessel of, of Earl's building arrives the Olanta which you can still charter from Peru rail for tourist cruises on Lake Titi, uh, Lake Titi, uh, Titi, um, Titicaca, which is a nice thing to do, but um, yeah, oh shipbuilding and the whole scandal of the National Shipbuilder Securities, which frankly, the uh, is you almost have a competition going on where um, Henderson as third sea lord is going around giving money to companies to keep them going and improve services. 
and any he doesn't get to in time, the NSS is basically winding up in the name of economic efficiency. And yeah, they they, they it's a government sponsor, uh, sponsored rationalization of the UK shipbuilding industry, and it's the most stupid thing to do in the 19 for early 1930s. But there again, it's the British government in the early 1930s. There is all sorts of stupidity things going on now. Yeah. National Shipbuilding Securities. Please look them up if you're interested. Anyway, let's look at something more interesting than that, hopefully. And this is, of course, Emmanuel Blenker and Clara, a.k.a. Vice Admiral, serving under Lord Cochrane, and then First President of Chile and First Commander of the Chilean Navy, um, serving July 1826 to September 1826 as President, after having several fights with the very Congress which had uh, chosen him. Basically... This is what happens. He gets selected as president. And... He then says, well, you've selected me because of my knowledge and skills and understanding. And these are what I'm going to recommend to you. And he finds out that um, they don't want to listen to him. And so he keeps arguing with them. And they're all very sure they're right and he's wrong. I would say what happens is, broadly speaking, he ends up Resi he ends up not being president any longer, and then he ends up getting commissioned and going and fighting their wars for them. And in both, uh, basically, they're still they're pro happier to listen to his advice when he's an admiral in command of forces than they are when he's the president. Probably because when he's the president, if they're following his advice, it starts to sound like the dictatorship, and they all feel they should have their. Uh, their view in, whereas if he's a commander, they can pretend they are listening to the commander in the field and, well, you always help, do your best to help the commander, don't you? That's not a loss of honour. You're not following someone's instructions or orders then. It's all, um... The cynical part of me says that that particular period of history for Chile is not exactly their most uh, enamouring. But I would say there are a lot of wonderful characters and wonderful stories there. A lot of wonderful history. And so here is what the Blanca Encalada looked like herself. She is a central battery ironclad. And what I found great, and I have to say I found really great. Again, this is not something you will find on the English language pages. But, if you go and look, and I've been shameless about submitting this in the future, when I'm looking for pictures, I go and check Wikipedia. Because, if Drakenefell doesn't have pictures in his collection, and I don't have pictures already in my collection I have permission to use. The Wikipedia ones, I can be fairly certain I'm allowed to use without anyone getting upset with me. Especially as I do it for academic, academic purposes and educational purposes. And here you go. Isn't this cool? Now... Let's change this way around. Let's change this way around. Oh, it's still... Why is it still flopping up that way? I have no idea, but it's not really... I, I, I want it to be... the other way around. But... Life happens. Life happens. Life happens. Bingo. Ah, oh, thank you, Explit. So, as you can see, this is how the Cochrane 
and the blank enclave were laid out. As you can see, you have the axes of movement of their guns and their arcs of fire. You have the fact that four of the guns could theoretically fire forward, two could fire theoretically aft, and theoretically you could fire all, f well, three on each side as part of your broadside. They have an armoured structural position. And again, if you start to map this out with the design up above, you can make a clear inference as to what is going up inside that armor. That's the engine. So basically, you've got your firepower and you've got your boilers and everything else protected. The most armor and the most protection you can build around them. It makes for a survivable ship. It really does. It makes for a capable vessel as well. Because that is the big thing they wanted. They wanted a capable vessel. They wanted something which would be capable of dealing with the best that was likely to come from the other South American nations at the time, and which was also capable of not necessarily intimidating, but standing up to and representing itself as a capability to be respected by major powers navies when they came to visit. Displacement. 3,480 long tons. That's 3,540 tons. Length, 210 feet, 64 meters. A beam, 46 foot, 9 inches, 14.2 meters. Draft, 19 foot, 8 inches, that's uh, 6 meters. So basically, what you get is of a ship designed around it, to, around being maneuverable. Again, it's worthwhile thinking. It is being designed around maneuverability. How can I say that? Well, if we consider that HMS Warrior is 128 meters long, for beam of 17.8 meters, and as we know, beam length to beam ratio is often used as a method of either if you want it put a long a ship, make it long and thin, you're going to make it fast. But it also means it's got a longer hull for the water to be exerting pressure on it if it tries to maneuver. So you're going to give it a larger turning circle. If you make something shorter and fatter in proportion, i.e. A, a smaller length to beam ratio, and this one it's almost a 4 to 1 ratio. Not quite. Not quite. But it's not far off it. Sort of four and a half to one sort of thing. You've got a ratio which is designed for maneuverability. You've got a ratio which is designed to give you the ability to go in close to shore, to maneuver with difficult geography, and to still bring your guns to bear. A bark rig sailing structure. Six cylindrical boilers supplied two trunk steam engines, which drove two shafts with 3,000 indicated horsepower. Mm -hmm. For a top speed of 12 knots. Or a range of 1,200 nautical miles at 10 knots. It's pretty good. Complement, 300. Armand, six 9 inch, that's 229 millimeter. Muzzle loading rifles. One twenty pounder gun. One nine pounder gun. One seven pounder gun. Now, 
there are different stats given at times. Um, at some point, you reckon to have two 20 pounder guns and two 7 pounder guns. It seems to me that depending on what they've got going on, they do change the armor around and what they've got available. And that's again perfectly normal for the time. Belt, four and a half inch to nine inches of armor. With the nine inches being a midshipman, a midships, and the four and a half inch in the fore and the stern. The battery has between six and eight inches of armor. There is a three inch armor on much of the deck. Especially the areas which need to be armoured. We're getting to two inches towards the extremities. Conning tower, four and a half inch. Bulkheads, six inch. It's a well armoured vessel. It's a well protected vessel. She enters service and almost immediately becomes flagship of the Chilean Navy. Her first actions are under the command of Admiral Juan Williams Robardello, which consisted principally in taking part in the blockade of Inquique and uh, the expedition to the Port of Calo. She literally comes into service and is almost immediately swept off into war because she is commissioned find my notes she's commissioned and c completed in 1874 and then she goes to Chile and it takes a while to get out there then you get everything set up and everything needs to be working out and actually she's uh, her sister's completed in 1874 she's completed in 1875 She's renamed once she gets to Chile from Valparaiso to Blanca and Clara in 1876. So it takes time. But by 1879, she's a worked up ship. She's been in the Navy for a couple of years and she is now a flagship. And she is a very capable vessel. In this picture, you are seeing that capability. And what do I mean by that? Well, you're probably looking at ships and go, ah, so this must be the Chilean Navy she's leading. No, this isn't. This is her meeting other navies. We have HMS Champion. Uh, we have... Another English armoured cruiser, which they're not sure about. And the US American Corvette, Lackawanna. By the way, it says US American Corvette on the, on the photo description. But I agree. I do agree. And she is there with these other ships, because of the things going on, because those other navies are taking an interest in the blockades and in the actions going on in the Pacific War, and it's important that Chile shows up with status. To make the point, we are carrying out this blockade, we're doing it properly, we're doing it efficiently, look at the quality of our ships, and we're doing it respectfully. She does it well. She does it really very, very well. So let's get into the War of Pacific and why this all this forces gather there in the first place. And yes, I am wearing a hat a lot these days, but that's because well I like the look of the hat. 
Now, the War of the Pacific... Oh, good lord. It's another good example of why secret alliances do not bring peace about to the world. Because you have disputes going on between Bolivia and Chile. You have disputes and disagreements between Peru and Chile. And Peru and Bolivia have a secret alliance. Now, the interesting thing is the war lasts for four years, six months, and 15 days. Before you get the Chilean Peru Peruvian peace. The peace with Bolivia. Uh, well, there's an armistice agreed in 1884, but peace isn't finally agreed with Bolivia till 1904. And the result of this war is that Bolivia becomes a landlocked country. Until this point, Bolivia had had a navy, they had had contact with the sea. They lose it in this war, in the War of the Pacific. And Chile ends up even larger than she had been before. It's also known as the Saltpeter or Ten Cents War. Um... Sometimes considered to be the Second Pacific War. And it sort of, to an extent, both settled and created the modern version of the Tacna Arica dispute, which is. Oh, a, a, a whole another fun, which of course in 1929 uh, 29, um, is when is compromised well, is, there's a compromise reached in 1929 where um, Arica goes to Chile and Tacna goes to Peru but it doesn't exactly make for anyone to be happy What can I say? It's international relations in a post-colonial world. In a in a post-colonial world, where everyone is trying to compete for the resources and resources, which used to make the colonizer rich, when they controlled the whole thing. The war itself. Well, if you are looking at it from a pre-war strength, you would think in 1879 that the Bolivian army of 1,600, nearly 1,700 troops, the Peruvian army of 5,500, and the Peruvian navy of four ironclads, seven wooden ships, and two torpedo boats would be a fairly formidable force for a Chilean army of... 2,400 roughly, two ironclads, nine wooden ships, and four torpedo boats to take on. However, by 1880, when you've got mobilization going on, including the army of Lima, uh, you have the Peruvian army is up to between 25 and 35,000 men, depending on who you're talking to. The Bolivian army isn't really doing that well at this point. The Peruvian Navy is at three ironclad, seven wooden ships, and two torpedo boats. Okay, they've lost an ironclad by 1880. And the Chilean army is at 27,000 troops in the Anti-Lima force. They've got 8,000 in the Occupation force, and 6,000 in the mainland, which 
by my counting, this is my counting, would give them roughly 41,000 troops. They also have three ironclads now, eight wooden ships, so they've gone up by an ironclad, which they might have nicked from the Peruvians, and ten torpedo boats. So they've gone up by six torpedo boats. So the Chileans lost a wooden ship, gained an ironclad. The Peruvians lost an ironclad, didn't gain any ships. So sort of starting to see how these things go. And then the war overall, well, in terms of killed and wounded, the Bolivian-Peruvian alliance loses around 25,000 and about 9,000 captured. For Chile, it's between, let's be honest, it's roughly 2,800 killed and wounded, you are probably talking about another 7,500. There are some stats and I think they're a little light. In other words, as far as Chile's concerned, it's pretty darn successful. And it does start off with this blockade. It starts off with, basically, the Peruvian port of Inquiry is blockaded by the Chilean Navy. On the 21st of May, 1879, the Huasca, a Peruvian ironclad, and one of the ships I have looked at in the key ship series, sinks the Chilean corvette, the Esmeralda. And the Peruvian frigate, Independencia, chases the Chilean sco uh, schooner, the Covandonga, through shallow coastal zones until the heavy Independencia rammed against a rock and ran aground in Punta Gusa. Now, these resulted in the lifting of the blockade, a blockade of the port in Inquia. And it meant that the Huska becomes a primary target. Huska, of course, is... How do I put this politely? Well, it would be described as an iron, a steam ironclad turret ship. And, or sometimes, as an ironclad turret ram. Basically, imagine a monitor put on a monitor-style turret, put on a hull which can actually go out into open waters without looking like it's going to sink every five seconds, and has a ram on the front because, you know, everything in life is more fun with a ram. And very quickly... Chileans realise that, frankly, this is their number one target, and you can see why. This is it. This is the Huasca. And, well, the Chileans go, hmm, we can win on this. And so, the Battle of Angamos takes place. And this battle involves the Peruvian Huasca under Miguel Grau, who is one of the better naval officers of the entire war, but he gets caught here by Juan Jose Latour and Gavani Ganales in their two armoured frigates with two corvettes and two transports as backup and those two armoured frigates. Well, they are none other than the Amarante Conqueren and the Blanca Encalada. Yes, Their two most powerful ships. Those two ships which had been ordered pretty much eight years before against the protestations of the previous president by the then current president because he thought a war might be coming. The fight is something amazing. At 08.030 hours, the gap between the Huasca and the Blanco Enclada had reduced to 3,000 metres. Cochrane closed in two. 
Now, you have the advantage... Let's be honest, the turret ship has the advantage of theoretically greater field of fire because they can point their guns in sort of any direction as long as it doesn't hit their own superstructure and they can maneuver their ship to free those up. But these ones, these ironclad frigates, the central battery ironclad frigates, they are better at sea keeping and they can do the maneuverings. Of Punta Angangus uh, at 0925 hours, Grau opened fire over the Conqueror. This began the engagement. In return, the Chileans didn't answer. Latour didn't. Focusing on approaching Huasca from its stern. Fifteen minutes later, Cochran. And this... It's not Conqueror. This is Blanca Enclada closing in. Cochrane retaliated from about 2,200 metres. Her guns on the starboard side caused serious damage to the monitor from the start. Um, the first shot pierced Tuasco's turret, wounding the tw other cr 12 crewmen, manning, the free uh, manning her guns. This got rid of the best gunnery personnel they had on the Huasca. Another shot managed to perforate the armour just above the waterline, cutting the left rudder chain and leaving Huasca temporarily adrift. Cochrane sustained little damage. And the thing is, you have to remember, Huasca is also still limping around because of damage she sustained when she'd rammed the Esmeralda in Inqui five months ago. That is how she had managed to break the, break the brocade of Inqui, uh, by ramming the Esmeralda. However, by, I would say, 20 to 10, they have an emergency rudder set up, and everything is looking good. At 10 hundred hours, another shot from Cochrane strikes the bridge cabin, killing Amaral Grau and his adjutant, Diego Ferrer. This means command falls to Captain Elias Aguirre, Aguirre, who is not a bad officer, but he is not Grau. The Chileans were using palliser type armour piercing rounds and these were exploding right after penetrating the hull and causing severe damage. At 10 past 10, the Huasca's flag was brought down from its hoist by the gunfire. The Tor immediately ordered a ceasefire, but when he found out the ship hadn't surrendered and an unidentified officer hoisted the flag again, they resumed combat. And the Huasca crew can actually use that time to repair the rudder again. At 20 past 10, Banco Lela El Enclada entered the fray. Firing from 200 metres away, she perforated the Huasca's turret, killing all the sailors within, at this point, and damaging the rightmost cannon. Another shot from Cochrane, passed through the officer's quarters and wrecked the emergency rudder station. Now disabling it for a third time. Huasca can now only sail in a while a semicircle to starboard. They slowly tried to regain control of that, and when they did, Aguirre tried to ram the Cochrane. Latour was also manoeuvring to ram the Huasca. But both vessels veered to port and both ships passed by each other. Another projectile pierced Huasca's turret 12 minutes later, killing the remaining people inside, including Captain Aguirre. Commander of the ship at this point 
falls to Lieutenant Pedro Guazon, who in conference with the remaining officers decides to scuttle the ship rather than allow it to be captured. At 10.54 hours, the order is given to evacuate the wounded men from the engine room and open the main condensator, uh, condensator to scuttle the ship and prevent its capture. At 10.55 hours, Huasca's flag chain was caught again by the intense gunfire. And the Chilean warships, noticing that Huasca was decreasing speed, mustered their boarding parties. At 11.08 hours, 14 to 20 sailors, depending on how quickly they're getting there, boarded the Huasca without resistance. They managed to close the main condensator water leaks and this is when they managed to close it when there was already 1.2 meters of water in the engine room extinguished several fires while the prisoners were transported to the larger Chilean vessels Pedro Grazon at this point or pointed out to the Chilean officers that the flag was on the deck together with the chain because they had all been cut off by the enemy shots. Thus the flag was never brought down, nor had the ship been surrendered by the Peruvians. One of the Chilean officers then observed, well, something similar happened to the Mag Magallanes. But, uh, Magallanes. But, um, Magallanes. But, you know, I got it right in the end. But it didn't really matter. What mattered was the Huasca was now part of the Chilean Navy. And they were planning on using her. Now, at this point, you get the blockade of Arica, which is conducted by Cochrane. Kawandanga and some transport ship, which we're still not sure of what it was to this day. The town of Rika was relatively well defended, and four batteries, including one on Bluff, and the other three built on the sand and turf. Um, lots of foreign ships observed this, including various vessels from the UK, France, and the US. What they did find interesting was on the 13th, an Allied army of uh, mixed armament and about 2,000 strong had augmented the garrison to around 8,000 uh, troops. Many were native Armenians from the mountains. But in the Battle of Rika on June the 7th, 1800, the town of Rika was taken by Chile. And it was taken by Chile because getting all these people in had been great. Keeping them supplied with food was a bit of a problem, though, because guess what was the internal line of communications for Ch Peru as well? It was the sea. So actually bringing in all those reinforcements was a brilliant idea if you thought the attack was happening soon. But those reinforcements, the longer time goes on, all they do is serve to eat all your food. And make your already difficult supply lines even more problematic and even more exposed. It's one of those things. If you don't bring in the reinforcements and the enemy attacks immediately, you could lose, because you don't have enough troops. If you do bring those reinforcements, and the enemy can afford to bide their time, then you lose. Because they're going to do you damage. So the basic problem you have there is never fight an enemy who can afford to pick their time. Because they can attack, it, attack immediately, if you don't have the troops and they can leave you stewing and losing and running out of food if you do have the troops 
But after this comes the Battle of Calo. Now, Calo is the primary port to Peru. It's located only eight miles from Lima. And the blockade began on April 10th, 1880. And lasted until January 17th, 1881. Lima itself was actually captured by Chilean land forces on December the 17th, 1880. When the Peruvian Navy realized this had happened, they honorably scuttled all the ships that still resided in Calo's port. And the city fell. As you can guess from when the, when the blockade stopped on January 17th, 1881. And that is, of course, why you get the eventual victory by Chile. Because... They have cut the Peruvian capital off from the outside world with the blockade. Then all the forces are sent to reinforce the blockaded town because that's where the Chileans are going to come from. Land forces come in, take the capital, and the troops are all in the wrong place. And the troops fall soon afterwards. It's a good, it's a good and interesting war to learn from strategy-wise. Unfortunately, for the Chilean Navy, they only get roughly a few years of peace before they have their own civil war to deal with. And the Chilean civil war is... How do I put this politely? Ugh. Basically, the president of the Republic at the time, Jose Manuel Balmaceda, did not like the Congress, because they weren't allowing him to do what he would like to do. And basically, the war happens over the fiscal budget of 1891. He wasn't getting the, uh, the stuff he wanted. Unfortunately for him, that is, unfortunately for um, Jose Manuel Balmaceda, Whilst the army divided, pretty much supporting both sides, the navy, almost to a ship, goes to Congress. He gets a few torpedo boats. Now, that turns out to be enough for the Blanca Enclada, because it is a couple of torpedo boats which account for her. But... At a certain point, he's lost. He's lost before the war's even begun because the Navy didn't support him. And I'm not really sure if they could be, should be called revolutionaries because, to an extent, Congress is trying to run the country as constitutionally it's supposed to be. And the president is trying to run the country, I would say, efficiently. Both nece don't necessarily want wrong... The, both seem to want the, the best things for Chile. Both seem to want the best results for Chile. And the arguments honestly seem to be more about how you go about it. It's kind of an interesting scenario. You think about today, we have debates going on in... You know, filter all around the world in terms of modern politics between... Often arguments over form. You see, you often get people going, oh, well, you know, we don't expect laws which are made in this part of the country to aspire to apply to us. Well, you're part of the national system. Of course they're going to apply to you. You're part of the same nation state. Laws happen. We can all... Uh, the laws apply to all of us. But the thing is... There are ways and systems to try and balance. Built into every system, there are balances. Every form and every form, uh, system, there are balances, checks and balances built into it. Some some are obvious, some are less obvious. Some are tradition-based rather than codified constitution-based. But they all have them. And respect of those systems and operating with them is often more important than anything else. The president
wanted Chile to be, how would I put this politely? He felt it should be far more personally run. He felt it would be more efficient. You'd have less debate, less argument, less... How do I put this politely again? Less stalling. It's one of those things you have often turned up today in another critique of democracy as often as, oh, these governments, they don't react quickly enough. You know, uh, they're all, there's all this debate and discussion and then you... Um, you know, how does it compare to these dictatorships, etc., these strong countries? The thing is, the discussion is a feature, not a bug. And yes, dictatorships often do react most quick, more, more quickly to events. But often their solutions are only marketed as being more efficient and better rather than actually being efficient and better. The thing is, if you have no debate and discussion going on of the options that are available, how can you be sure you're actually picking the right option? And when you're implementing it, if no one's going to talk about the problems of it, how are you going to refine it to make it better? And if it does turn out to be terrible, how are you going to change it? You just double down. Because if you don't, you're saying that the dictator got it wrong. And there are few ways in this life quicker to get yourself killed than saying a dictator got something wrong. Few ways in this life quicker than that. Now, the Chilean Civil War. If you talk about the sinking of the Blanca and Glada, well, Congressional Naval Forces included, of course, the Armoured Frigate Cochrane, Blanca and Glada, Corvette O'Higgins, the cruiser Esmeralda, that very nice ship which I've also done some videos about, uh, which ends up going and of course working for the Japanese and taking part in the Russo uh, in the Russo Japanese War in Baltashima, the Monitor Huasca and the Canora Mangalas, uh, Canora Mangalas, a gunboat. Manuel, well, Barcelona's forces only included the torpedo boats that were in the slipways, protected inside the shed at Calata de las Torpedas. The other crews of vessels, such as the President Azores, uh, President Pinto, and the battleship uh, Capitan Pratt, were under construction in Europe. And the corvette Abato was returning from its trip to Mediterranean, and the to uh, torpedo boat Almirante Condal was sailing across the Atlantic. Now... This loss, of course, didn't break them. It was supposed to, but it didn't break them. And it's more interesting because the junta of Inque, which had been running the show, basically, the Congress had sent up this the junta, this command group. Their secretary general's aboard, and he gets killed. His brother then becomes a new secretary general, which perhaps shows there are some of the issues going on, certainly. The factionalism, the... Uh, the cementing of power in certain families, etc. This all is part of the political system which Chile had, but there is no such thing as a perfect system. And seeking to break the wheel in order to create a new one is not always the best system to go with when you're trying to build a new political system. The war ends much as you'd think it would do. The Civil War really does end and much as uh, much as you think it would do because honestly without control of the sea without the naval forces to control the maneuver occasionally disputing maneuver but usually suffering as a result and the Blank and Glada is the first vessel, armored vessel in the world to be sunk by a self-propelled torpedo, which is pretty darn cool, but, you know, you'd prefer not to lose those people. It, It's already sort of going on, in that this war is decided from the beginning pretty much by... 
Congress's own control of the systems. And this is something which Balmasada hadn't really understood. Congress had control of the Navy because their families were the Navy. Their families had gone and served Navy officers. Yes, only the good ones were promoted, but they were still part of that family network. And you can't as easily replace naval officers as you can army officers. Because they need to run a ship and they need to be experienced. And you also need to have all those facilities to support a navy. And also the fact the navy is, by its very nature, decentralised in various points around the country. So you have lots of people. And once you also factor in control of the nitrate mines and control of the taxation of the nitrate mines, therefore the money from them, you have the reason why on September the 19th, the day after his presidency would have ended, José Manuel Balmaceda commits suicide in the Argentine embassy. The war took between five and 10,000 people's lives, which doesn't sound much out of a population of two and a half million inhabitants, but you can imagine that's going to be inordinately from the part of the population who cares about their country and its direction, the people who are going to be motivated to get involved on both sides. The interesting thing about the Board of Inquiry is after they assumed control, after their victory of Balsamedas forces, they transferred to Santiago, they set up a new board, and that called for new elections in accordance with the Electoral Law of 1890. It reinstated in their positions the officials of the judiciary dismissed by Balmaceda's instructions. And that is another problem and discharged the members of the armed services forces who had served Balmaceda and reorganized the civilian personnel of the parts of the government which had served him. The person who assumes the presidency in December the 26th is Admiral Jorg, Jorg Mont. And that really is the big thing to me. Because it shows you why and what happened. If you do not have control of the naval forces, you don't have control of Chile. And that was Bamacida's big problem. Now, your Mont um, had been one of the people, uh, the key people in charge of, of the faction law to the Congress from the beginning. And he's one of the senior Chilean admirals. He will serve as president from December 26, 1891 to September 18, 1896. He'd been president of the government of the Junta of Chile from August 1890, 31st, 1891 to November 10, 1891. He had been general director of, well, he would be general director of the Chilean Navy from 1897 to 1913. And lives until 1922. He is an experienced officer. He had commanded the Esmeralda in 1877 at the outbreak of the Pacific War. He participated in the Battle of Angabos, 
and in taking of Pegasa, and had directed the blockade of Calo in 1880. He was a full captain by 1891. As well as a uh, senior officer. There's some interesting things going on there. He's a very experienced naval officer. And he is the key to congressional victory. But he's also the key to understanding this war. So, what was Blanca and Glada worth? The world to Chile. Her and her sister, they were what gave them the capability to win. Gave them the strength to win. In the War of the Pacific. And gave them the years of service and the personnel experience that meant that when the Chilean Civil War came about, Congress had a firm navy to call upon. It could have been a far worse war, a far nastier war. Whichever side you come down on, control of the navy basically decides, and the navy basically decides who wins. And it's thanks to her and her sister that you have a navy of that capability. Chilean navy. A fun thing to consider, really. These are, they are one of these navies which is consistently important in their region. And to this day is consistently important. They very rarely have the uh, best ships in the world. The Esmeralda is perhaps an example of that. Uh, uh, perhaps a rare exa uh, example of the uh, country. But they have really good quality ships. And they invest in quality personnel. And they have done throughout their history. Sadly enough, they also invested in quality torpedo boats, and both these last two pictures have been the torpedo boats, which were involved in the attack on the Blanco Enclada. So what are the lessons of the Pacific, the War of the Pacific? Well, most navies turned up with, so if you don't have an armoured hull, it ain't worth t uh, it ain't worth anything in combat, and if you have armor-piercing shells, you'd better have somewhere of defeating them. So armor needs to be improved. I would argue that it's this war which require uh, provides a lot of impetus to development of better and better nickel steels, and eventually Harvey steel, and then crop cement armor. It's thanks to this conflict and then the Spanish-American War that really push that on. I'd also argue that the sinking of a large and powerful ship by torpedo boats is something which, sadly enough, doesn't get enough attention paid to it. Well, it does, but it doesn't. It, it gets attention paid to it in that people think, okay, best method of defense is a good offense. So let's sink the torpedo boat before it sinks us. So let's put rapid fire guns on ships. And that makes sense, but then someone goes, let's put link up the torpedo with something which is underwater so you don't get to engage it with those rapid firing guns because you don't see a target till it's too late. So basically someone needs to invest some more in anti torpedo defenses and also in subdivision. Basically, double hulling, stressing the hulls, putting in uh, more and more bulkheads. Probably uh, not just latitudinally and deck wise, but longitudinally as well. If you can divide a ship up into compartments across it, 
along it and up it, you can really minimize the egress of water. But you are also making the hull far heavier. You are making the cost far greater. And you are making the naval architecture far more difficult. And all these things are lessons of this war. And normally, I end these videos with a question. And normally it's something, you know, go ahead and think about this, 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 and I'd like to hear your comments. What I'd like to hear you talk about, and I, I realize I get to see this in the comments you put on suggestions for patron topics especially, but I'd love to hear your suggestions for what should be done. In terms of historical research, let me explain this. I am writing books and I'm involved in ship shape and I'm doing all this stuff. I'd like to hear your ideas for promoting historical research because ship shape is interested in this. And there's going to be another advert for ship shape at the end of this. I've, I've, I've been sent the video, so I'm going to tack it on to the end of this. But I want you to think about what can be done to make how do I put this naval history more engaging what can we do I, you know I'm not saying we're going to take up the ideas I'm not saying we're going to be able to deliver on the ideas but I'd like to hear the ideas because even if I can't deliver them or if I don't take them up they usually do spark other ideas and it part of engagement to me is always listening to what the uh, what people say they want to hear how they would like to be approached and i do realize if you are talking and watching this video roughly an hour and 20 nearly an hour and a half into it you probably already like naval history to quite an extent and if you're watching it so i am to an extent preaching to the converted but you never know and i'd love to hear what your ideas are for improving engagement thank you very much for watching and hope you enjoyed Imagine you're not only doing the thing you most enjoy, but you're doing the thing you most enjoy and you're doing it with three of your best friends. If you're going to shoot for the moon, why not shoot for the stars? We create more as a whole than we do as individuals. And Australia really is about taking that principle and going big with it. There's actually a huge amount of preserved naval history in Australia. There are engines from the Crimean War. Museum ships, museums. They're not in the UK. They're nowhere for us to find in the UK. They're in Australia. Engines from the Crimean War. Artifacts, all sorts of things. And then we've got the ships which are preserved there. They are the last of their kind. And in some of the cases, they have the last two of their kind. The only two in the world. And a lot of this stuff, you know, if I didn't know about it and Dr. Clark didn't know about it and uh, the other two didn't know about it, well, then it's fairly likely that there's a fair amount of stuff out there that maybe you haven't heard of either. In some ways, we actually resemble a classic D&D raiding party. <laughs> now, exactly which of the two of us between myself and Dr. Clark fill which role is up for a matter of debate. Two of the finest naval historians that, that I know. Don't tell them I told you that, but they are. We all know they are. I like to think that Dr. Clark fulfills the tank role since he literally has to take on most of the organisational duties and so forth. Uh, and I like to think I fulfill the DPS role as I'm the one who's usually charging around with cameras and climbing into inadvisable places, regardless of vertigo. He is a walking database of information. It's just amazing to see him work and to work with him on these things and discuss the things with him. Gareth is the bard, since he actually knows how to talk to people in general uh, and relate things 
to others in a way that perhaps we wouldn't understand. You cannot imagine the wealth of knowledge and crazy bits of information that are in that historian's brain. Did you know in Buffalo Naval Park, if you go there, inside, buried in one side one of those ships, is a wonderful little museum about the Vietnam War? I mean, the stories he has picked up, the little bits of history, it just brings everything alive. It makes it all pop. It's just, it's just amazing to work with. It's so much fun. Uh, Dan is, I guess, the cleric because he has all the healing capabilities since he is actually a, you know, a trained physician. He's also a team medic, so that he kind of has a, a place where even if he didn't have any naval history knowledge, but he does. And you get him into those areas on a ship where it's his area and wow. Anyway, I, I don't know what I'm doing with this lot. They bring me along. They mutter something about needing a healer. Um, and, uh, yeah. So as we all know, if you want to, you know, successfully complete a quest, you need a full party, a cameraman each for when it was necessary. Dan and I could support Alex and Drac in the creation of their kind of major content. We could be the people who held cameras, who spotted things they should be talking about with everything else, because we had the historical knowledge and frankly were prepared to spend five hours on the same damn ship. It also meant that duties such as navigation and driving could be split between us, which meant everybody got a chance to rest. And trust me, having now done a trip to the States where I was the only one who could drive as a, with a group of people and another trip earlier this year where I was the only one in the States and therefore having to do all the driving and everything else it is a it makes a huge difference and you've got some to share the driving with and when there's a problem in a hotel it's a case of hey then all four of us are in the same boat so one uh, whichever one of us feels most awake go deal with it and working with drac and alex is fantastic because i get to fill in some of those gaps that they have and suddenly the very obscure knowledge in my head becomes useful when they place it into a context Why is this stuff not known? Why is this not being sung? Why is there not massive a tourist attention being put on these ships? And so we thought, yeah. We got feedback from, from the museum ships themselves, from just people writing to us saying, I didn't know that I had this history on my doorstep. And we hope that what we can do with this is elevate awareness of some of these ships in the ship community that they are there to be visited the same with these collections the same with these small museums a lot of it's about making the history available to everyone um because history isn't for historians history is for all of us and historians are just the ones who help us to understand it and appreciate it We want to bring you videos, written content, behind the scenes stuff. You know me. I will do videos long recorded and lives from the trip. I will do shorts while I'm out there. I will do tweets. I will do all sorts of things. And I'll probably do some papers at some point. There'll be exclusive streams. Um, there will be videos that we'll be recording while we're there. From these ships, from these museums, from these collections we're going to visit and combine our knowledge to create something that's greater than it is as an individual. There's just so much history that can come out of it, and sort of sharing the history. And that's what the trip is all about, sharing the history. Obviously, we're not going to be you know, flying the jet set life. We're not asking for everyone to pay for the cost of first class tickets or, you know, stays in five star hotels and that other kinds of nonsense. Getting to and from the States and getting to and from Australia are two very, very different questions. It's not just a matter of distance. It's also just a matter of the international economy, the cost of accommodation, the cost of car hire where needed. With the hotels, we are kind of cheating in that we found a certain chain worked out pretty darn well for us in Canada. Trips to Australia per mile flown are just that much more expensive.
you will have a number of benefits. I'm desperately hoping that that, 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 that enough people of you take the tears that allow us to, to refight the Battle of Trafalgar, because I'm a gamer, I'm a streamer. You might know me from my uh, uh, Hearts of Iron 4 streams, my Victoria streams, my Crusader Kings streams um, on Twitch and on YouTube. The idea of doing some actual tabletop gaming and refighting Trafalgar for a man who has a cat called Napoleon is, uh, is, is quite an exciting prospect. And to do it potentially with, uh, with commentary from, from Kate Jameson, the, the only person I think who actually stands Collingwood more than I do, will be a great joy. There'll be challenge coins at some of the levels. There'll be books off of the shelves. I mean, you can see part of the library here. So, you know, there's a few books around here that could be making their way to you at uh, certain specific tiers. There are biographies and autobiographies behind me of admirals that I don't think even Drac has, and that's saying a lot. So some of those might end up in your, in your, in your, in your mailbox. Japan, Italy and beyond are all on the radar, but to do that we need to do this one first. I hope to see some of you in Australia, and for the rest of you I hope you get to see what we find in Australia. Cheers! Give us a little bit of your money, and let's get to Australia and let's get you some amazing content from some amazing ships.